Coming Back is a listener-supported podcast. To support the show and get exclusive access to podcast swag, giveaways, private grief hangouts, and more, head on over to patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia. Support the show for as little as $1 per month and change or cancel your support at any time. Thank you so much for listening. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after loss. On today's show, I'm talking to psychotherapist and author Debbie Augenthaler, who lost her husband Jim over 20 years ago to a sudden aortic aneurysm. Also on the show today, I'm responding to an email from a young listener who's afraid to die just like her father did, doing something that he loved. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learned to equip others with the knowledge to heal and remind them that they are not alone. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much for joining me today. A couple of months ago, I received a really thoughtful and touching email from a listener. I won't read the whole email here on the air because there was no um, indication in her notice to whether or not I could incorporate it into the show in full, but I feel like her questions were so pointed that all of us could relate to them in a way and learn from them as a result. So the woman that wrote me is a heart-centered musician, a 20-something just like me, who is in love with her craft. Her loss is her father, a man who is in love with his own craft, a classic car that he fixed up and spruced up to the point where my letter writer actually got to take it to her senior prom. She writes that her soft spots in life are her dog and her dad, and you can tell throughout her entire note that their love is so incredibly strong. Her growing up seems to have been filled with fascination for his craft, going on car rides and watching him fix it up and talking about her dad's passion, and turning back around her dad's fascination with her craft. He wasn't a musician himself, but he supported her and listened to her music every chance he got. Just reading this email, I felt so much love and such a bond between this woman and her dad, so of course I was heartbroken to read that she lost him just last year. And not only that, but he died in the classic car that they both loved so much. And in his death, the car burned to the ground. Not a trace of it was left for my letter writer, something that her dad had always promised her she could have when he died. The listener posed two questions to me at the end of her letter. The first one was, without my support system, how do I continue to chase my dream? And the second one was, how do I know that the thing I love so damn much won't kill me too? So first, my beautiful listener, thank you so much for writing in. These questions are both hard, and unfortunately, they're not questions I can answer once here as the end-all be-all. So what I'll do today is offer some wisdom I've gained from my own grief and from the guests that I've had on this show. But as you know and have probably learned, and as all of my grief growers out there know, you have to find answers, and you'll keep finding answers as you live your life. You'll search for them, and they'll come to you. And no one ever truly has the last say on your grief. To answer your first question, without my support system, how do I continue to chase my dream? I would say first go back and listen to episode 39 of Coming Back with Candace Ossifert Russell. At the top of that show, I did a segment called How to Recapture Your Creativity After Loss. And there's a process in there that details grieving a creative practice after a loss happens. Because whether or not you've acknowledged it already, your music has changed as a result of your dad's death. How it has changed may remain to be seen, or you may have noticed it already, but you've got to acknowledge it, reframe and release the loss of what your music was before his death, and then swing open the doors to the possibility of something new. The something might be a totally new passion for you that's not related to music at all, or it might be your music played or sang or developed or practiced in a different way. 
whatever it is, the changes in your music need and deserve grieving. And that's a way to continue to chase the dream is to continue to grow with it. And to acknowledge that just like you, it has changed as a result of this life altering loss. Beyond that, I noticed that you use the word support system here, and this might be a little bit trickier to find because ultimately you can't replace your dad's support for your passion and your music. And I'm sorry. I I am really, truly sorry about that. And it's just another heartbreaking truth of losing him is that he can never support you in the same way in life again. And I would kind of consult your gut here on how to move forward. You could do a rallying of the troops, so to speak, like calling in friends and family for an extra boost. You can lean on your bandmates or other musicians in the community, especially if they have lost someone that they have loved as well. And beyond that, joining an online group like my private Facebook group, The Grief Growers Garden, might be a wonderful spot to continue honoring your dad and the influence that he was on your music without feeling awkward or too exposed, bringing up his loss in a public space like the music industry. You are very, very wise in sensing that you're going to continue to need support as you move through this creative process. So many people out there just say fuck it and try to carry on by themselves. But our dreams need our support first, but they also need the support of other human and spiritual energies around us. So kind of draw those in. I'm getting a sweeping motion right now. Kind of draw those in in a way that feels best to you. Ultimately, at your core, know that you are supported by your dad still, and by me on this podcast, and by everyone listening to this show today. To address your second question, how do I know that the thing I love so damn much won't kill me too? Um, this question and the way that you phrased it just absolutely tore me in two. You and your dad shared fascinations for each other's passions and he died. You don't say how he died, but he died in the car, in that passion that he loved. He was literally adhered to this humongous source of his joy when he died. And because the fire and the damage, he took it with him. This is a very, very real fear that you're bringing up here. A lot of people fear dying in the same ways that their that their loved ones did. But because you witnessed your dad doing the very thing that he loved, of course you would be afraid of dying doing the thing that you loved. How could that not suddenly become an association for you? And I cannot reassure you that you won't die in the same way letter writer, I cannot tell you that your music won't kill you. Because, I mean, look around. God knows there are so many examples of people in the music world dying for and because of their craft. What I can tell you, though, are two things. First, let this grief make you conscious. Conscious enough to tune into yourself and to take care of yourself. And secondly, ask yourself, Is the thing I'm doing right now something worth dying doing? Would I want to die doing this? I'm getting chills right now, which if you've listened to the show long enough, you know that's my signal for we're touching on a big truth here. I know that your dad died in the car that he loved, and it literally burned to the ground. This robbed you of the chance to to take that car as your own and to keep that piece of his memory with you. But he left you, and I'm going to say this, he gifted you, my letter writer, with an even stronger memory that you can absolutely positively die energetically adhered to your passion, your joy, and your creativity. That's a possibility. As a fellow 20-something chasing the hell out of her dreams through this show and my work and building this space here for all of you, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that if offered the choice to die doing this or some other way, I would choose this, my passion, hands down. I would die right here and right now at this makeshift podcasting studio in my bedroom if somebody gave me the options for my death. And I'm not trying to glorify your dad's death or my death. I'm not trying to glorify death, period, here, letter writer. I'm not saying that it's better that he died in the way that he did. What I am saying, kind of in regards to your question, if you allow fear of dying doing something that you love, take away your ability to do the thing that you love to do so much, 
energetically, wholeheartedly, creatively, you are already dead. I'll say that again. If you allow fear of dying, doing what you love, stop you from doing what you love, you are already dead. I've never had this conversation with you on the show before, Grief Course, but I believe we are here on this earth to find out what lights us up and to chase it and chase it and chase it until the end of our days. If it's knitting or reading or playing sports or walking dogs or making music or remodeling cars, whatever it is, we are here on this planet to be curious and excited and passionate and joyful and full of life, literally consumed by life. We're allowed to chase our passions and have multiple passions and change our passions and to always be on the hunt for what our passion is, but to live a life of unconsciousness and settling and and being afraid or avoiding or, or trying things maybe when we're older, we have more money or the kids are out of the house, frankly, to me, is bullshit. I'm sorry, but this is bullshit. To not honor our loved ones and their deaths and their losses by living our lives in a way where we would be proud and aligned and nearly explosive if we died right here and right now is a world of nightmare for me. To not allow my grief to crack me open into chasing my joy more fully and more deeply is my biggest fear. To not allow this life-shattering, disastrous, as Megan Devine would say, universe rearranging event to make me into something more bright, more hopeful, more capturing of light and joy is already a form of death. If you allow fear of dying, doing what you love, stop you from doing what you love, you are already dead. Your passion, your music, your greatest joy could kill you, listener. It could, just like it could kill any of us, just like it killed your dad. I will not come on this show and give you all the other ways you could possibly die so you can rationalize your way out of being afraid that your passion, the thing you say you love so damn much, could kill you. What I will do instead is ask you a different question. Is this something you would want to die doing? My grief growers, I did not expect to go to this place today. In planning for the show and in writing these responses, I did not expect to get to this place. But this show... Coming back is about powerful truths in life after loss, and that's exactly what you're getting today. So letter writer, thank you so much for writing in. Please remember to honor how your music has changed as a result of your dad's death. Take care of yourself. Be gentle with your spirit in the wake of his dying. And lastly, use the way in which he died, doing what he loved. As a catalyst for asking yourself, is this something I would want to die doing? Not every moment of our lives has to be powerful, inspirational, or momentous, grief growers. But if death and loss and grief keep us from doing the things we love, are we not already dead? Some big truths to think on this week. I want to talk more on this idea of grief keeping us from chasing our dreams. I hope you'll join me this Monday, June 4th on Facebook Live at 1 o'clock Central Time, where we'll talk about using death and loss as catalysts for pursuing our passions. Just like my Facebook page, Shelby for Scythia, Intuitive Grief Guide to be notified when the broadcast begins. Next up, I'm talking to Debbie Augenthaler, whose husband died suddenly in her arms. Debbie Augenthaler is an author and psychotherapist in private practice in New York City, where she is specialized in trauma, grief, and loss. Prior to becoming a therapist, she had a successful career in the financial industry for more than 20 years. Debbie has a master's degree in counseling for mental health and wellness from New York University and completed a two-year post-grad advanced trauma studies program at the Institute of Contemporary Psychology. In 2012, she received the NYU Steinhardt Award for Outstanding Clinical Service. 
Her newly published book, You Are Not Alone, A Heartfelt Guide for Grief, Healing, and Hope, combines her personal story of devastating loss with practical insights and simple suggestions for healing. Just a heads up, grief growers, that my computer decided to spontaneously run updates during mine and Debbie's interview time, so this interview was recorded via phone. Debbie, welcome to coming back, and we're so stoked to have you here, not only to talk about your new book and share your lost story with us, but kind of delve into how you're making grief known in the world. So if you could please share with us your lost story, what got you here? Well, the the lost story that got me here happened over 20 years ago. Um, My husband, Jim, died suddenly, uh, unexpectedly. He was uh, perfectly healthy as far as we knew. And he, he, it was early in the morning on a Monday morning and he had a little discomfort that he thought maybe was heartburn or something. We had no idea. We were both very young and uh, felt dizzy. And he said, I feel dizzy. And he fell on the bed and he died. And it was shocking, obviously, and traumatic. But I didn't, I didn't know that he was dead until they had pronounced him at the hospital. And um, so it was a, a super... Uh, 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 just an overwhelming experience and um it took a long time for me to recover from that but it certainly sent me on the path where i am you know where i've landed today so to speak so in kind of talking about jim i guess the question that's coming to mind for me is beyond like a partner to you who was he to you in your life he was um, he was nine years older than me, and he uh, he was more than just you know my husband. He was my best friend, and had he really helped me. He saw it, like he helped me build confidence in myself. We met when I was in my early twenties, and we were friends first, and so which formed the basis. You know that the friendship deepened over the years, and then eventually you know became you know we fell in love. But he just taught me. Uh, to believe in myself, to go for what I wanted, that I, I was capable of it, I could do it, and and to not hold back. And and so he he, he was just everything to me. And when he died, we've been trying to have children um, for a year, and uh, he had two children from his previous marriage, but we wanted also to have children of our own. So when he died, I lost not only my husband and my best friend and my life partner, but I also lost, you know, the family that I thought we were going to have, the future that I thought we were going to have, and who I thought I was going to be in the world. And as with any great loss, there are, you know, there's layered losses to that event, and you only find out what they are as time goes by, and you realize, not only do I have this trim, the biggest loss ever, I'm, I've lost this, 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 you know, and so... Um, it was just a, a hugely impactful event, and now I can look back and I and I know what a gift he was in my life, and the gift that he gave me. Um, and so when I decided I wanted to change my career from being in the financial world, and I went back to grad school, and I went the non traditional route. You know, I left I left my job, and I said, "This is I really want to become a therapist to help people like my therapist helped me." And I know that I, I wouldn't probably had had that confidence and, and, and the ability to, to, to really say this is what I want to do, but then to really actually do it. And, and, and that's a lasting gift that's always with me. I want to take a second and kind of circle back to the concept that you just mentioned of layered losses and not really mm-hmm. finding out what all these losses are until time goes on, until you're in them and said, oh, as a result of this big loss, I'm losing all of these too. And -hmm. sometimes they're referred to as like secondary losses or invisible losses. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can share with us kind of almost like a rundown, like a list of everything that you lost in in losing Jim, because people try to compartmentalize grief uh, so much. And and especially with this, it's just something that kind of, I get a visual of an earthquake, but where it like rumbles out and there's ripples into every single aspect of your life. Absolutely, Shelby. Absolutely, it ripples. It, it r- ripples and reverberates into every single aspect of your life. 
And sometimes it's not until months later or even years later when you can have gained the perspective to look back that you can really understand just how much it is you lost. I mean, I, I was just, I, I, you know, in the book, I call that, I call the beginning of it shattered because I felt like, you know, I, I was shattered. My heart was broken, but my life was shattered and blown apart. And everything, you know, who I thought I was had changed. You know, I, I, I had this whole trajectory that, you know, we all have like this idea of how our life's going to take shape. And no matter whether we get married or whatever it is we do, but you know, when you're in your mid thirties, you have this idea, this like, okay, well, this is, this is the job in you know, my career and this and that. And so when something like that just totally blows apart your life, it's, it's like it is an explosion. And there are just, I felt like there was just bits and pieces of me left. And um, one of the places that I was still, quote, me, was at my job. But everything else had changed. And so I lost my my life partner. I lost my best friend. I, lo- I lost, I lost my, you know, belief. I, I had, I, I was so angry, which is a common, obviously common thing, but, you know, I just lost my, my belief system. Like, I, I, for a while, I felt like, what kind of God would do this? You know, not just to me, but to everybody who loved Jim, and um, and to Jim, too, because what, what he died of, it was, it was an aortic aneurysm, and so it was, there was, he, we thought he had been healthy, so there were, it was just so sudden and unexpected, and he was in the prime of his life, and and a very beloved man, his great friends, great family, great kids. And, and you know, it just seemed just impossible that he could be here and then he wasn't. And so I felt I, you can call them, there's also another term, it's like ambiguous losses that people don't n- notice as a loss. But, um, uh, yeah, and, and the children that we were trying to have, we didn't have that. I, I, I lost. The person I confided in, that like, he was my everything, really. And uh, um, at the whole list, I gosh, I, <laughs> how long do we have? <laughs> you know, you know when you think about it, right? And he, like, he, I, and in the book, I just say like the person I wanted most to turn to for comfort was gone. He was that he was my that my person. Like like when something happened, I would go to him. You know, I mean, I had many friends. And I was very lucky for the love that surrounded me but he he was he was my person and so he was gone so who who was to help me get to this you know and um yeah it's uh it, it, you i lost the my friendships with certain people changed because i was no longer you know part of it. we weren't together and it was just it that changed as as the year went through another year went through and now you're no you know i'm living in suburbia and now i'm not married anymore and i'm surrounded by people who are married and with kids and so you know it's just all the everything changed how people looked at you uh it just there are a lot of losses yes absolutely and i think they're different for everybody and they do come back uh, when you look back with perspective you're like oh i lost you know, that financial stability and didn't really notice there. Oh, I sold my house mm-hmm. and, you know, that kind of mm-hmm. is something that came with it too. And I was kind of, oh, of course. I wasn't, right, I right. wasn't consciously ticking it off as I was reading your book, but I was like, oh, wow, right. there's another thing that she lost and another thing that she lost and another thing that's that she right. lost. Okay. That's for sure. I write, cause I write about, you know, having, I moved back into the city, but like our home, we had a townhouse and we were saving money to buy a home, a house house. And, and uh had been there for several years but like that was my first home you know and 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 as an adult and uh and I and I didn't lose it so to speak that you know I, I willingly sold it and moved back into New York but you you know it, it it was another loss to let that go that had been filled with love right and and so yeah and it's just Again, you don't even you're not even aware of it sometimes until you look back and you're like, yeah, I lost that too. You know, I lost that sense of stability and um, that sense of uh, home. So, mm-hmm. and I, I kind of want to circle back again because you said something uh, along the lines of losing friends and losing you know these relationships with people, and you phrased it in a way you said because I was no longer married, and I'm interested in in what it's like to be no longer married because of death 
out of force. Like you're mm-hmm. you're not no longer mm-hmm. married because you want to be. It's you're no mm-hmm. longer married because death has taken your your person, your partner, your husband away. Mm-hmm. So how mm-hmm. I'm kind of wondering what conversations were like with with you and for you between, you know, maybe you and friends that you had that were divorced or maybe you and friends that were still married or friends that had also lost spouses or if that was a reality for you at all. Well, when when he died, this was before 9-11, and I didn't know anybody else my age who lost a spouse, with the exception of one friend who was a friend of uh, one of Jimmy's friends who had lost her husband and died years and years before, and she was already remarried and, and everything. But I didn't, I, there was no peer group, so to speak, and there was, it was, that's, one of the reasons why I wrote the book that I wrote is because I wanted to write the book that I wish I had had and I needed the perspective I suppose to write it too but I wish I'd had something that could witness and validate my experience because we're not born knowing how to cope with an extreme with any kind of we're not born knowing how to cope with grief period right and because we live in this grief phobic society no one really talks about it People want to avoid it. And I really, it's important that, 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 you know, it's okay to be a griever. It should be okay to be a griever. So some people, because I wasn't, you know, I, they were there for me in the beginning. They were very supportive. But because, you know, when you're part of a group of people that, that the couple socialize because of the kids or that that's kind of like where your, your life is in suburbia, that, 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 that it's just, there's a circle, right, and of people, and, and you have things in common. And one of them is is that you're, you're that that that's how our social life is structured out in, in the suburbs. And so, it wasn't that people said, oh, we don't want to be friends with you, but it was a natural thing for when there were in the beginning. I wasn't going to, to I wasn't really socializing that much anyway. But you know, it's natural to to gravitate. To people people would stop inviting me to things. People would avoid me. And at times, and not because they wanted to hurt me, but I, I, and I think they avoided me because a lot of people, it, it seems as though grief feels like it's a disease that you might catch. And that, and seeing me can, would remind people either of their own terrible grief, you know, if when Jim died or, you know, in facing their own mortality, because people don't want to face it, don't want to think about it. And, me walking down the street was a reminder, you know, they'd of course see me and the first thing I would think about is like, oh, our husband died and he was only 45 and um, it just reminds them that, you know, life doesn't go on and on indefinitely uh, in the way that, you know, there's always upsets and, and, and tragedies and things like that that can happen, but we all are going to die. And that's one of our, that's, for many people, I see it with my clients too, you know, their greatest, that's their greatest fear. Or that someone that they love will. And, um, you know, there's, because we don't talk about it, I hope, I hope the conversation is starting to change in the world because so many people are grieving, as we can see from the headlines every day, via all the tragedies, you know, natural disasters and, and tragedies that are happening throughout the world and in our country. But, but, um, people try to, you know, they, they want to compartmentalize. That's the word you use. They want to compartmentalize and not have to think about it. And um, I, I know, you know, I, I had no idea, and that's why I had no idea what it was like. And so when he died, I felt, I felt very much alone, even though I was surrounded by love and surrounded by support. I felt like nobody. I, I didn't. I didn't. I felt like I was going crazy in some of the things that were happening and how I was feeling because you don't, you know, it's something you have to learn how to do. And so to go back to what it was like to being married and then suddenly not through a death, you have the fact that you're no longer part of a couple and, and, you know, people don't, that's just a natural, a lot of things, you know, good friends will still include you. But I, I, I noticed over the following year being excluded, you know, from things and, and feeling uncomfortable maybe if I was invited, that I was the only one there. And then you compound that with, also, the reason I'm not there with my husband is because he died, and people really don't know what to say to you anymore. And and that's okay because we, you know, but but it it's not. I shouldn't say it's okay. 
I came to learn that that was the experience. And sometimes people would say really inappropriate or hurtful things, not meaning to, but because they really didn't know what to say, right? So it just became, it was, it was, and, and you can consider that another loss because like the whole, it was like my whole social, my whole world kind of changed, right? And so, um, it was just, it was, it was, Really, and, 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 and that happens for a lot of people. And I know that from working, you know, as a therapist with a lot of clients, and I'm sure you know that from the work you do too, right? This whole sense of like, my whole world has just evaporated. Um, except for, you know, the people that are close to you that, that you can turn to and that are there for you. And it's super important. And, um, for anybody listening, if you, if your circle is really small, um, you know, there are alternatives now that there weren't for me at the time, but find some person, find one person at least that you can really talk to that can be there for you and can be your friend and can stand the pain with you. Um, you know, my therapist was crucial to my healing. And, um, and like I said earlier, she's the reason why I decided I wanted to become a therapist. I wanted to help people like she helped me. And that's a story that we hear so often on coming back is I was helped by somebody in such a radical way that I knew I had to turn around and be that for other people looking for what I was looking for. It's very much, Mm -hmm. um, I almost feel like it's, it's kind of like reincarnating while still being alive. You come Mm -hmm. back with all these lessons and you're like, okay, now you're pulling up the people who are on on the level below you and they're pulling up the people who are on the level below them. And, and it's just Mm -hmm. this really kind of infinite loop of, I have been supported, so now I will support. And Absolutely. It's, it's really beautiful. It is beautiful. And I, I call it the, these are the gifts of loss, which can mm. take time, right? But they are gifts because we grow, you know, Rumi wrote, like, it may take years to realize what was calamitous at the time was instrumental in your spiritual growth. So it, you know, we, we hear so many stories about that, right? Where, where something, you know, some, some kind of, terrible tragedy or adverse event really can change somebody and can make them do meaningful, you know, help them make, do meaningful things in the world. And going back to ripple effect, again, how far, how far out does that ripple, right? Well, you, you help one person, just one person. You have no idea how many more people you're going to help because who is that person going to help? Who is then going to help someone else? Like you just said, going, you know, paying, going on and on and on. And I, I do, there's a part in the book, which I, I know you read since you read it, but, but where I talk about how just by being, by being somebody who has survived a loss and you're back out in the world and you are happy and you, 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 you just by being who you are can show, can give somebody a seed of hope. And just by planting a seed of hope, a ray of light, you have no idea how important that can be. But when, and when you've been through a, a big loss or a big life-changing event, your compassion and empathy grows because you do know and you know what it's like, and and you can hold you can hold that space with somebody, right? You can be with somebody, and I I I write about that too. How my experience led me to real eventually realize, like I was able to be with people started turning to me, friends and family, and then of course in 9/11. You know, they would turn to me because they're like, because there there were so few people my age that had been through something like that, that that they like, how do you do it? And I, I would, I'm like, ah, you know, I put one foot in front of the other. I choose to get up in the morning. You know, you don't even know. It's not like, oh, I'm so some. It wasn't like I, I, I felt like I, I was in on any secret. It was just the fact that I, I kept going. You know, and and um, but I, it, it taught me. That I know, like I said, there's a gift of loss because you you can. It's such a gift to be able to help somebody out, and you and you can make meaning out of your own loss when you can do something that's really meaningful for somebody else. When you can give them that gift. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right, and it, it manifests sometimes in ways that you don't necessarily expect it to. Right. That's right. So I want to talk about kind of logistically like the structure and the format of your book because it's something that really really resonated with me like as soon as I got into the first bit which is called shattered and Mm -hmm. there's these these tidbits of your story and then there's a segment called for you 
And then Mm -hmm. there's like a poem or some kind of um, small, I don't want to say it necessarily ascends to a spiritual place, but when we're reading poetry, we're definitely in a different mindset than we are when we're reading straight prose. And so Mm -hmm. it, it was really interesting to me because I haven't seen this format for a grief book yet. Grief books can tend to fall into a very like how to, or mm-hmm. they can tend to fall into like very scientific study and research, or they can tend to fall into this was my entire experience and it's very much a memoir. And this was kind of a fusion of three different things. Mm-hmm. And I have to tell you, I, I really enjoyed reading this because when my all time favorite piece of this book was the chapter called Cinnamon Toast. And <laughs> I, I don't know why it resonated with me so strongly, except that food was such a big part of my grief journey, both mm-hmm. uh, both avoiding food and refusing to eat and eating so much that I would like pass out or fall asleep and then wake up and not remember what happened. And that was kind of a grief. Food was a, a big grief coping mechanism for me. But for you, it was like, you know, the first thing that you were truly able to eat mm-hmm. uh, and, and to keep down and that tasted I won't say necessarily tasted good, but you were like, I am receiving this. Like my body is finally receiving a food instead of, you know, robotic eating or things of that nature. But in, in a little bit after that, that was like for you, you were like, you know, it might be marshmallow fluff right out of the can. It might be potato chips. It might be steamed broccoli for like three weeks. But just there's, there was a lot of permission given in these spaces. And I kind of just want to acknowledge how cool that was to see in a grief book. And I'm wondering also how you got that idea for this to be the structure of the book to say, I'm going to tell my story, but I'm also going to make sure that it's not just in the epilogue, it's not just in the introduction, but throughout the book, I'm going to make sure people know that they have all of these permission slips too, permission to cope. Oh, thank you, Shelby. I, I love how you describe that. And I, 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 and I appreciate you saying, because I, I really spent a lot of time when I was thinking you know, what kind of book did I, what, what did I want? And what kind of book do I want to give my clients? And and one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is that I wanted to reach more people than I could one to one in my therapy practice, right? Like I wanted to reach a lot more people. So it's like, how can I make it? Like, like I wanted to make it like a book, not only that I could give my clients, but that I could give anybody who's grieving that has that, that, you know, as a therapist, I can't, I, I couldn't go and say, well, I know how, you know, I've been through, like, you can't really talk about, it's not about you, it's all about the client, as, as, as I'm sure you know, but I, I just, I, I felt it was important that, um, because I can show, I can show, I'm not telling, because I know I didn't want to read a book that told me what to do or told me how it could be done or any kind of dense clinical book, but by showing, using my own experience, I can show that yes, I do get it. But what what I saw, I, I picked universal kinds of experiences that mm-hmm. resonated with me when I sat with clients, when I was you know with friends, when people that would tell me yeah you know, that that were grieving that I I I write about in the book you know nine eleven. I knew a lot of people who died during nine eleven, so I had this experience over and over, and I I thought you know this this when someone would talk about an experience, I, it would bring to mind immediately my, quote, my own unique experience of that universal kind of experience, right? So we all have, there, like you said, your experience with food. We, I think many of us have that experience with food because, and I, I can say it from a clinical perspective because in the sense that, you know, our bodies, when we're, we're under tremendous grief and shock, our bodies interpret that as, you know, the survival instinct of we are in danger. And so there's that fight, flight, fight, or freeze response. But your body isn't working like it would normally. It shuts down because you're trying, it's, again, it's interpreting danger because it's a, it's a basic, it's a, it's a, it's a basic instinct. And, so we all have some kind of experience like that in our bodies, and, and so that's why with cinnamon toast, I, I use my own experience to kind of illustrate that that happened. So the way I structured it is I I started I, – I love poetry, and certain things I would read over the years, over time, it just struck me. Like, gee, I wish I had seen that or read that. Or, wow, this really – there's a – like, for instance, like there's a John O'Donohue – um, excerpt from one of his poems and it's just like oh my god this is exactly how it is or you know the Mary Oliver poem that I got permission to use and and because 
anything like that that really resonated. So I, I collected these things over the years. And, and um, so when it came time to write the book, I just, in my mind, I wanted to use my own experience to show a universal kind of thing that can happen. And then the second part of each chapter is written with my therapist's point of view, but I write it as if I'm talking to you as, as if you're my as a friend. And um, I'm not telling you anything. I'm just trying to give insight and explanation. And um, here's a word I try to stay away from, but, you know, normalization. Like, we well, are not, you will not be, you know, I, the, I can't tell you often when somebody comes in and they think, you know, I'm going crazy because this is what I will be doing and, I'm, you know, I don't want this is happening and I think I'm, I, I'm, are, am I the only person that's ever felt like this? And I'm like, no, this is like a common, common natural response. And the look of relief that could flood across someone's face and you can sense the energy shift in the room. You can just see their shoulders like almost like soften and droop from relief that you mean I'm not. And so I felt it, it would be really helpful if I could show and, and, cause, and because people like to read stories, I think grief stories really, really matter. And everybody's grief story matters. And we all like to hear other people's stories or read other people's stories of how they coped and how they got through it and what they did. I mean, that's just, it, it's helpful and it's interesting. And, and um, so we all like that. That can be very helpful in healing. And then just to give the insight that I have, um, you know, as someone who's worked with a lot of grieving people that I have found that can be helpful because there's not, you know, and we're, we're all different and there's not a formula. There's not a how to. And, you know, and when we talk about stages and we talk about this or that, and but there, you know, you can you can have them happen all at once. It can be spread out. You bounce back and forth. It could be 10 years later. I mean, as you know, and, and I, I reference that in the book, but. So I thought the second part, having the kind of like the gentle kind of guide, I like to call it, um, because it's not dense clinical language, but it is, it's, you know, it's informed by my training um, and, and the work I've done. And then I wanted to have a very simple for you section, as you brought up, where it was just, you know, what I could offer anybody in this moment, like it's especially at the very beginning, just like be kind to yourself. Oh wait, well, you know what? I shouldn't say at the very beginning. We should all always be kind to ourselves, right? But, but, um, but don't be so hard. Don't judge yourself. Or just, just breathe. Cause maybe that's all you can do. And maybe that's, that's what that will help in the moment. So I, I had a very specific idea. The reason I structured it the way I did and I do it throughout, you know, the whole arc of the book from the, from, from the very beginning when I thought I, when I was hopeless to the very end, you know, where I am, I'm very happy and filled with joy, and I, 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 that's my hope. My hope is to just be a ray of light and a seed of hope for, for someone else. And I, I, I just, um, it's funny. It, I, and it really kind of just all came together because I, I remember I was reading one of the poems. I thought, boy, and I thought, I thought, I love this. I, I really want to have this in the book. And I thought, you know, what about in, like take, going through all these little pieces I've collected and just see. What might, you know, or I would say, or I was reading one, I said, this would go perfectly with chapter X, Y, and Z. And so I, I, I just, and I like it. I like poetry a lot. And, and I, and it kind of takes you out for a minute, right? When you're reading it, like you can go into, like the story is, 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 can be very dramatic. And I know it, it's hard to read at first only because, you know, it's, it's sad, right? But, mm-hmm. but, but you can use the, I, so then you get to take that breath with the, the, uh, the guide part of it and then the for you part it, ta- it takes you in different places so it gives you a chance to pause to breathe to reflect and maybe you know if you're newly grieving um, or still grieving and in and, and that way where it's too like uh, you may not want to read some of it but you might want to read part of it so I also specifically did it that way too so if you wanted to all you could do is go through and read the for you so you could read the poetry or you could read the story um, and so I, I'm, I appreciate that you can see that and, 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 um, yeah, I, I, so that's why I did it. Cause I feel like that, that we all need, even in the midst of our own grieving, you need, you need that breath, you need that pause. And if you want to help someone who's grieving, you know, it's, this book, it's, it's like, 
it can help you understand what somebody else's experience is and why somebody can be, you know, today I don't think I can talk to anybody. Today I just want to stay in bed. But the next day they could be, say, yeah, let's go, let's go have a drink. And I want to laugh. I want to, you know, it, it, you know, we're not always in the same place. I, and I love that you said the, the permission because, you know, who am I to give anybody permission? But, but it's this idea that, that, you know, cause I, and I have a chapter called gift of permission specifically because I felt like, and I write about this is that there, you know, there was some societal rule book of grief, unwritten, unwritten, you know, I you can't go check it out of the library, but, but you can't buy it on Amazon. But like, I didn't know it, but like, was I failing some, some rule book that I don't know about? And so this, this, I had this experience where I felt like someone quote gave me permission to fully embrace my grief and, and, and have it and to be wherever you are in it, that's okay. And I get chills even now thinking about it because it was just such an important concept. Like it's okay. And you're, you're, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be where you are. Don't judge your grief with somebody else's grief. Don't feel like, you know, you're supposed to be somewhere because someone says you are. You are where you are. Um, and what's most important is that you're, you're feeling your feelings, right? And, and you're experiencing it. And, and your know, grief is the price we pay for love. And if you're, when you're grieving, that, if you're grieving, if you're grieving the death of someone or the death of a relationship, I mean, that means you have loved and been loved. And that there's an honoring in that. And so I, yeah, <laughs> I can, like I said, I think it's at the beginning, Shelby, I could just, you know, talk about this for a long time. Uh, yeah, that was just one of the biggest things that I picked up on is how this book was laid out was different than other grief books I'd seen before. And I think that's really important because I did feel like I had that space to breathe while reading. And I did feel like I could shift from, okay, that was her story. And it wasn't quite my story, but something was mm-hmm. similar. And then there was like the permission given and these small like chunks and nuggets in between. And I was like, ah, oh, this is really, it was just easy to absorb. It wasn't, you know, a whole heap of permission dumped on you at once. And it wasn't mm-hmm. all of your story dumped on you at once either because especially, yeah, those first four or five chapters, oh my God, it just rips you to pieces. But of course that was your life and your experience was this level of, tragedy and holy Mm -hmm. crap Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. yeah it was just it was a phenomenal experience to read and I really enjoyed that part of it Um, I'm getting to a place now where I'm curious to know from you if you had to point to a singular thing or maybe even two or three things that you could really point to and say this is what helped me come back to my life again what would they be probably from the darkest points of my life is what is what really kind of brought me back and I, and I, I write about that in the book too because it, you know, it's in those deep, dark times, dark night of the souls, as they say, that you can have a, a transformation or grace can come into your life or you can just have a real shift in perspective. And I was still at the point of feeling like I would never recover from this experience that I would, it's the grief, you know, the grief of losing somebody you know, loving it, that grief, it changes shape over time, but there's a part of you that's always going to have the grief, right? You're going to always miss that person. I know it's your mom, right? It's, this is this idea that, that, so it's there, but you can learn how to live with it and live really well and, 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 and carry that also. And you, your heart expands and you can carry bigger love, you know, all that, all that. But on this one particular night, I had just given up and I, I, had a, a moment where I just just didn't think it was going to be possible, and I just was not able to walk up the stairs of, of our townhouse. I was still living in our home, and I, I I just I just didn't want to face like I just didn't want to face it anymore. And in that moment that night, um, it's like it was like a sudden revelation, I guess, or I'm not I'm not quite sure what to call it, but it just this message came through loud and clear that like you know this is not what jim would have wanted for me he would hate for me to be this miserable he'd be pissed off at me he'd be really angry with me like well get up like you got it you know but um and i'm just laughing because like he would be like, come on all right enough time is gone you know it's 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 but i i just felt like so i guess it, it's really the love that i that we shared the love he had for me and the love i had for him and also the love that i was surrounded with 
like if I was to keep on like I was, like I wasn't honoring him or our love or anything. And, and, and if I, and the people that loved me were so concerned about me, you know, so I, I would say that it was, it was this, this love that, that made me feel like, um, the love that we shared. Like I wanted, I, I, I would have to do something about it. And I didn't know quite what it would be, but it wasn't to continue on, um, being so, uh, so mired in my, sorrow that it was impacting you know my life um i was able it wasn't like i i mean i was going to work and i was doing things but i i was keeping that stiff upper lip for the outside world but inside i was still just so hopeless and it just gave me hope when i when i when i was able to reframe in my mind um that to honor him and to honor the person that he was and how what a gift he was in my life you know and and also to honor all those people that that were there supporting me and loving me and you know understanding but but encouraging me to to just you know my therapist too and like just to get that this was part of grieving and I and so that that deepest darkest time was when I think I was able to to that's when hope kind of came in and so I would say yeah the love that love and um and the love that I, I that still lives on. And I believe that a hundred percent that love doesn't die and it always lives on in our heart. It it and energy just transmutes. It's a law of conservation. It doesn't end. So it's still alive and you know, in me and, 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 and it lives on forever. There's you know, um the continuing bonds of love, right? The connected bond of love doesn't die. It's always there. So I think to be able to see it that way, um, real, that really helped me from my darkest time. And and now, you know, I've had the, the time, the years and the perspective to look back and other sad things have happened in my life. Um, and I have, it doesn't mean that I don't grieve and, and, and everything, but I, I have built, I, I, ha, I understand it better now. It doesn't mean it doesn't still, you know, take me down at times when things, something really sad happens. But, um, but it always comes back to, uh, when you love someone that much, that's, that's what's going to happen if something bad happens, you know, and, um, but that's what brings me back out too. And that I want to, uh, I want to turn something bad into something good if I can. You know, some, to, into some kind of something meaningful, which is what I'm doing with this book. I, I want it to be helpful. I want to help others, and I want that's and that to me is um, is like the greatest gift. I love it, and I think this book is such a fitting tribute to who he was in your life and how this experience of losing him has helped you transform not only your life but the lives of so many other people around you and perhaps people that you have never met and will never meet uh, Mm -hmm. before this Mm -hmm. lifetime is through. So I'm wondering what are some other ways, like really, really briefly, like how do you continue to honor Jim in your life today? How else do you continue to remember him? Oh, well, you know, it's still by talking about (laughs) with what I'm doing with the book, but you know, um, every, I uh, still talk about him all the time. I'm, Still very good friends with like his friends and uh I but I, I have I have rituals that you know I still uh I don't go nearly as often as I used to do but you know every anniversary um wedding death birthday Easter <laughs> Christmas I you know I have flowers at his grave and, and I probably will always do that you know and I'm in you know in another significant been in a significant relationship, but like at that, we, it's, I still honor who he was in my life by the different rituals and, um, that I have, that I, and will always probably do. And, um, uh, by letting the, by still like, you know, through this book and, and, and the work I'm doing, always bringing him into it, I feel like it's part of his legacy, you know? And, uh, so, and that's honoring him. Debbie, it's for, Wrapping up today, where can people find You Are Not Alone, and where can they find you beyond the book? Well, uh, You Are Not Alone is available. Um, you can go on my website to order it, but you can also go on Amazon. It's at Barnes & Noble, and uh, my web 
website is debbieaugenthaler.com and that's D-E-B-B-I-E-A-U-G-E-N-T-H-A-L-E-R.com. And on my website are all kinds of, uh, you know, it's more information about me and I have a, a great, uh, Facebook page called Grief to Gratitude. And on Grief to Gratitude, we share daily, you know, inspiration, uh, just, just some nice quotes. Again, a cluster of little poems and quotes and things like that. And, um, some writings I, I write often. I, and I do have a newsletter once a month that if you sign up for it, it's just, I like it. It's like lots of different information and books I might be reading or poems I like, or I have guest bloggers who write with their own stories because I like grief, you know, to share grief stories. And also very uplifting, encouraging, helpful, and, you know, that encouraging. And on my website are also for free are there's several videos that I posted that can give you things you can do in the moment if you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed that can help bring you back down and uh, calm you in a moment of, of high anxiety. And they're very simple, four simple, different effective techniques that I use with clients. And I felt it was important. I, you know, just why not put it there for anybody who might want a little help in an anxious moment or a stressful moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing some workshops and retreats. And uh, they will all be posted or released via my newsletter when that comes out. Very cool. You're in a lot of places, and you offer a lot of things that are really, really easy to access. I think that's so important in grief to not not always have, you know, like a cost barrier or a membership barrier or things like that, and that's why I promote things like this podcast so heavily because this is free. You can grab onto it at any time, a time of crisis or a time of numbness or a time of really feeling feeling alone in your pain. It's really important to be able to, uh, I mean, what a gift to be able to jump onto Google these days. And to just say, you know, send me somebody who can talk about grief. Somebody, send me somebody who's writing about grief. Send me tools for Mm -hmm. an anxious or stressful or a really hard moment. And then you just find them and they're really, really easy to get to. So, so what a cool gift. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was so phenomenal to be able to speak with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was my pleasure and I really appreciate it, Shelby. I really enjoyed talking with you. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much to Debbie Augenthaler for sharing your loss and your book with us. Debbie came back by hitting rock bottom, the dark night of the soul, and asking herself if that's how her late husband would want her living her life. She also came back by seeing a therapist and writing out her experience in her new book, You Are Not Alone. You can find a link to Debbie's work, including her new book and free tools in the show notes. Join me for Facebook Live this Monday, June 4th at 1 o'clock Central Time, and we'll talk about how grief can keep us from doing the things that we love. If this show has transformed the way you see grief and loss, please support me and coming back on Patreon. All you have to do is head on over to patreon.com slash shelbyforsythia, where you can pledge for as little as $1 per month, that's less than 33 cents per episode, and get some really cool podcast rewards for doing so. If you liked what you heard this week, you can also support the show by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and by telling a friend about coming back, because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you so much to Mr. Addie Goldstein, who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby for Scythia Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Grief Guide Shelby for Scythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or a comment for a future show, leave a voicemail or text 312-725-3043 or email me just like our listener did today at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com subject line podcast. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I am proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing.